Hi, this is Jocelyn Strand. I'm a naturopathic doctor from northern Minnesota. Last August, I took the director of clinical education position with Biobotanical Research, which is the company that makes Biocidin. I'm happy to be here today to share my clinical experience with the product line and also um, some of the research that we've done and what we've got going on currently. Before I launch, I'd like to just send out wishes for everyone as we navigate uh, new territory sort of unprecedented times for us right now and just express gratitude that as as natural clinicians naturally oriented clinicians we have um, extra tools in our toolkit for supporting immune function and and health in both in ourselves and in our patient base um, so wishing you all well and that you have the tools that you need to support yourself and your patients at this time and also want to express gratitude for to EHS for its, their flexibility and continuing to make the uh, education available to us in a digital format. So before, uh, what I'd like, the way I'd like to start is to talk to you about my very first experience with Biocidin. Uh, so this is about eight years ago now, and I had a little girl come into my office uh, with her mom, and she was very small for her age and underdeveloped, and very slight uh, build, and also gray, she didn't have good color. Um, and her mom talked to me about her symptom picture and she was having respiratory distress that was silent um, after eating, within a half hour of eating occasionally. So it was very intermittent. It didn't happen every time, but when it did happen, it would happen silently and in a way that she would turn blue and pass out. Um, mom would take her to the ER. She'd been on multiple rounds of prednisone and was terrified that her daughter wasn't going to even make it to kindergarten. Uh, she had so many environmental allergies and so many food allergies at this point. She was only eating about five things, and her mom couldn't even take her to the library um, or to public places because if she touched dairy, even to her skin, she would have a full-blown anaphylactic response. So obviously a very scary patient for me to treat. Uh, you know, it's the sort of patient where we think, oh my gosh, if I prescribe anything, she's, chances are she's going to react to it. Um, so we proceeded very cautiously. I did quite a bit of testing on her. Um, we ran the CDSA, so Comprehensive Digestive Stool Analysis Testing, um, came back showing dysbiosis, overgrowth of pathogens, including some bacteria and candida, and then she didn't have enough or adequate um, bifidobacterium as well. At that time, I asked the doctor, what, uh, what should I use to treat if she had a recommendation for treating pediatric patients with dysbiosis? <laughs> Excuse me. I had never treated pediatric dysbiosis at this time, and she uh, recommended checking out Biocidin. So I did that. I, I ordered the product. We put this little girl on it, told the mom to watch very carefully for a reaction to the product. Um, she started at three drops a day based on her body weight, which was about 30 pounds and um, or just under. And she um, she came back in three weeks later, and she looked like a completely different person. She was pink. She was saucy. She was engaging, uh, she was happy, and it, it was one of those moments we all have in clinical practice that catches our attention, and um, and I really never looked back from there. I started using the product more and more in my practice, and it, and it illustrated a number of things for me. One uh, is the importance of, of treating dysbiosis and how profoundly dysbiosis can affect uh, systemic health and well-being, and under the circumstances, this little girl we found out later had also had a mold exposure. Um, she had also uh, had exposure to tick, or she had tick-borne illnesses at this time. And so she had many different things wrong with her. And um, by ser or serendipitously, we landed on biocidin, which, which has shown activity against all of those things. It really was for her a product that her mom thinks um, saved her life. And as a clinician was, was, um, was certainly very, very useful. So let's I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. I know I'm talking to a sophisticated group here. I won't read the bullet points off, but just to recognize that microbial communities, a healthy microbial community is important for uh, human physiology and the development of, of, the human, of human physiology, immune system development, digestion, detoxification, um, synthesis of multiple micronutrients, K, B12, CoQ10, all of these things can happen with a healthy microbiome in the gut. Um, in short, they assist us in maintaining health overall. 
if, if there is an alteration in the balance of, of the microbiome, whether that's through increased pathogen load, reduced commensals, or reduced diversity, all of the microorganisms in, and their functions can shift, and that can cause uh, dysbiosis. Um, that's been linked to not just local, but systemic illnesses, and we will talk about some of that today. So here's a list of the most common symptoms that we see as clinicians that are associated with SIBO, bloating and gas as number one, abdominal pain and or cramping, diarrhea predominant IBS, uh, so either IBSD or IBSM, or inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, constipation less common than diarrhea in SIBO patients, uh, food intolerances such as fiber, probiotics, gluten, casein, lactose, fructose, or others. And the way that I think about food intolerances in SIBO patients, and really in any patient with chronic gastrointestinal symptoms, is that they can be reacting to a food they're eating. They can be reacting to what happens to the microbiome when they eat that food. They can be reacting to what happens to their immune system when they eat that food. And so uh, there's, there are all of these different areas to consider, and they, they feed on one another. So it becomes this feed-forward cycle where the symptoms continue to snowball and, and get worse and worse. Uh, other chronic illnesses are often associated with SIBO, such as fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, diabetes, autoimmune disorders, to name a few. Um, history of proton pump inhibitors. So that one, there, there are mixed studies on that. Uh, so, you know, I think as as a naturopathic doctor, the way that I think about, about GI function in general is that if, if you turn off the production of hydrochloric acid, of course, it's going to have downstream effects. Uh, stomach acid is responsible for peristalsis. It's responsible for the release of pancreatic enzymes, which will break down foods. It's responsible for the release of bile acids, which help to uh, maintain microbial balance in the gut as well. So it, it makes sense that there could be a role to play here, but there are um, mixed, mixed studies on it. Uh, B12 deficiency, nutrient deficiency in general, but B12 um, and low, low hemoglobin or iron deficiency as well, and then fat malabsorption. So if you, if you see a constellation that looks something like this, then you wanna be looking for SIBO in your patients. These are the most common organisms that are implicated in SIBO, Pseudomonas, E. coli, Campylobacter, Acenidobacter, Staphylococcus, Klebsiella, Streptococcus species. Uh, you can see, I don't need to read the whole list to you, but you can see also on here E. coli. Uh, and those are the organisms that are in bold. I put them there because we, we've either done research um, or we've seen in vitro sensitivity using biocidin to all of the microorganisms on, um, that are in bold here. And, and gram-negative bacteria in general uh, we know produce LPS, they produce CDTB, which we're going to talk about. Um, and so they are tend to be really the, the bad guys in terms of producing metabolites that are irritating to the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. And one of the reasons that I appreciate Biocidin and the other products from uh, biobotanical research is that they, they really suppress the growth of gram-negative bacteria uh, and can work specifically on those areas, kind of no matter which paradigm you, you um, kind of associate with or, or uh, prefer. And there are a number of different paradigms right now or thoughts. And, and of course, I, I tend to think, take all of the paradigms that I hear and create my own understanding of based on what I see as in, in a clinical setting, um, what the research says. And so I'm going to talk about a couple of different paradigms for describing the underlying pathophysiology of SIBO right now. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about Mark Pimentel. That's that's this slide, and then I will also talk about um, information that I heard Kieran Krishnan of Microbiome Labs talk about uh, the potential for, and and that's two different things. It's it's LPS, um, which we know is a is an inflammatory marker produced by gram negative bacteria, and then also that there we have in the oral microbiome a lot of the microorganisms that are commonly implicated in SIBO, um, so making sure that we address oral health. So I'm going to talk about all of those indi individually right now. So about uh, last fall, I, I came into contact with this idea from Dr. Pimentel. I think his research was published a few years ago now, but uh, it was mind-blowing to me when he was talking about uh, the production of CDTB, which is cytolethal distending toxin B, 
and it's produced by gram-negative bacteria. Uh, according to Dr. Pimentel, that is produced after a food poisoning event. So if we get exposure to the microorganism and it, it causes a gastro, acute gastroenteritis, uh, and that initiates CDTB, uh, antibodies against CDTB, excuse me, and vinculin has a similar protein structure, is cross-reactive with CDTB. Vinculin is an, uh, it's a protein that's used in the production of the endoskeleton in the nerve cell. And if, it, if you have antibodies against it, it damages the nerve cell in the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. And that can um, disrupt the cleaning wave or the, and the pacemaker cells in the gut that, that help with the cleaning wave that moves microorganisms from the small intestine to the, to the large intestine and initiates the peristalsis in a different way from so it initiates that sort of paracelsis, the, the, meaning the micro, um, migrating motor complex. So this, this blew my mind. And the reason that it blew my mind was because if we have CDTB and antivinculin antibodies, and it's causing reduced motility in the gut through damage to our own cells, then it frames SIBO as an autoimmune condition. Um, and, and I think as a clinician, the reason that this is important is because we're not just dealing with cleaning up the gut. We're then having to have the patience and the understanding to also to share with patients, our, our own patients, uh, that this may take some time depending on how, how um, the immune system is supported, whether their immune system is healthy, if, how long it's been going on, how high are these levels. Uh, Dr. Pimentel was able to see that people who, who have very elevated levels of these two are, are um, more likely to have refractory illness. So they'll, they'll respond to the rifaximin, but when they come off of it, they're more likely, likely to get sick again, which to me indicates that we need to bring in some support for the, uh, for the immune system. The other thing that I, I'm trying to, that I think about when I think at, in a long-term way for, for us as clinicians is that CDTB isn't just produced during an acute food poisoning event. It's produced by all gram-negative bacteria. So I would like to, I, I'd love to know, <laughs> of course, but I'd like to sort of throw out there this hypothesis that if we have elevated pathogens in the form of gram-negative bacteria in the gastrointestinal tract, could it perpetuate the autoimmune condition? It seems likely to me. And so something like biocidin an antimicrobial like that that can come in, hold the pathogen load at bay, uh, could potentially take the load off the immune system and allow it to heal itself. And so it may be why sometimes as clinicians, we see the need for longer term therapeutics, which is kind of what I was trying to say before, and hopefully I've gotten the point across now. Uh, so this is another mechanism for dysbiosis to potentially trigger um, SIBO. And this article talks about how LPS, which is again lipopolysaccharide produced by gram negative bacteria, crosses into the bloodstream where it migrates to the blood brain barrier and to the dorsal vagal complex, causing inflammation there through TNF alpha and other cytokine, uh, pro, pro inflammatory cytokines. When that dorsal vagal complex gets damaged, then the, again, that migrating motor complex initiated by the vagal complex, dorsal vagal complex, isn't, it doesn't work as well. Um, so it's another mechanism to consider. Uh, and, and virtually the same treatment, maybe a different like, course of treatment, but um, is to reduce the, the pathogen load that is producing the LPS. So oral bacteria, this is an area that's really important. When I talk to my patients, I always told them, you need to use the liquid, not the capsule, to biocidin in order to, to treat in the oral cavity because if you miss the mouth, then you have the potential for translocation and refractory illness, although I didn't quite say it like, like that to them. But for all of you, you think about, we know that methanogens exist in the mouth. We know that campylobacter can exist ongoing in the mouth and can initiate IBS and IBD if translocated from the mouth. Um, Staphylococcus aureus and streptococci, these are all of the main players or some of the main players in SIBO. 
exciting news is that herbal therapy in this study was as effective as antibiotics in uh, treating SIBO. The reason that I like this, well, of course I'm biased and I like lower intervention therapeutics where, where possible, um, but also, you know, important piece to consider here is that rifaximin and other antibiotics have the potential to wipe out the gastrointestinal flora in a way that then requires further treatment for, for fungal overgrowth. So this is a nice alternative, lower, low, lower intervention therapeutic for potential for, for SIBO patients. So in addition to SIBO, and, and the reason I put the slide right after that one is because it's an easy segue into talking about why I prefer as a clinician to use something that's broader acting, not just antibiotic, not just uh, antifungal, but if you, can, if you can use a therapeutic that has all of those effects, uh, ingredients that have all those effects, then we have the potential to reduce the, the treatment course, not to create the same level of side effects for the patient as we get through, go, move through therapeutics. Um, this is Dr. Satish Rao, what he found in his 134 symptomatic patients is that 25% of those patients didn't even have SIBO, they actually had SIFO. If you don't know that, then you would go ahead with when you could actually exacerbate their illness. So it is important to identify which one that you have, um, or the patient has, excuse me. 30% were exclusively SIBO, 45% were, so the largest segment was both SIBO and SIFO. So they had broad spectrum overgrowth and broad spectrum dysbiosis. And if you combine the SIFO and the SIBO, the exclusive SIFO and the mixed SIBO and SIFO, that's 70% of the patients that had fungal overgrowth as well. Um, so the symptoms of SIFO look really similar to SIBO. I put in bold, here, the, uh, the symptoms that seem to be more, point, point more towards SIFO in a clinic, as a clinical presentation. So if patient talks a lot about brain fog, if they've had thrush, recurrent vaginal yeast infections, rectal itching, interstitial cystitis, chemical sensitivities, or alcohol intolerance, and that's because of the aldehydes that are produced by, by yeast overgrowth, um, ear congestion, eczema and skin rashes, toenail fungus, carbohydrate and sugar cravings, Absolutely, if they have a mold, uh, a history of mold exposure, that, that could be uh, something to add on to this list as well. Uh, but these are the areas that make, make me think as a clinician that we need to evaluate fungal overgrowth as well. CIFO, uh, so I'm saying fungal, it's candida. It's typically candida species that we're talking about when we say CIFO. Um, so having said that, candida and streptococcus mutans are the two organisms that are most often responsible for plaque production in the mouth. This study showed that when people brush their teeth after every meal, they had a significant and substantial reduction in, in um, candida levels in the stool, uh, which is it just it illustrates the importance of addressing what's growing in the mouth because of potential translocation from the mouth to the gut. So what is biocidin? I'm going to go into that just a little bit right now. Uh, biocidin is a combination of 17 herbs and essential oils. It was developed about 30 years ago by Dr. Rachel Fresco. She has a PhD in acupuncture and oriental medicine. Uh, and when she developed it, it was being used by doctors on, in the San Francisco Bay Area to help HIV patients keep their pathogen load at bay. One of those doctors submitted the biocidin to Great Smokies, which is now Genova Diagnostic. And the director of the lab called her and asked her what was in it because it was acting so powerfully against, against uh, the pathogens that they tested it against. So it was on over a quarter of a million stool samples. This was the most effective herbal antimicrobial that they treated and often was as effective in vitro as, um, as the antibiotics were. Um, so here's a list of some of the microorganisms that were on their list, Klebsiella, Staph, Strep, Candida, and Aspergillus. There are a number of different mechanisms of action in the in biocidin. So it is a broad spectrum uh, antimicrobial combination. So antifungal, antibacterial. Um, it also breaks down, but um, excuse me, antiviral, um, anti antiparasitic. So very broad acting in terms of its activity. Disrupts and dismantles biofilm formations. So this is exciting research, and it's really what makes our product a, a standout, in my opinion. Um, and we will go into that in more depth as well. And it's also immunomodulatory. So we do have a, a, 
clinical trial published about a year ago that shows that um, it helps modulate uh, IgA in the respiratory tract. Uh, this is the flagship product, Biocidin Liquid. This is the one that I use because I want to get that treatment in the oral cavity as well. We do have a capsule which is five drops of the liquid biocidin. I'm going to pause for one moment here. Okay, had to pause there. Had a, had a um, working from all of us working from home moment when my seven year old walk, walked in to ask me am I pin on a computer. So at, at any rate, hopefully this will, let's see, where, where was I? So um, biocidin capsule, uh, it is five drops of the biocidin liquid. I, I, I typically only use that as a potentially as a suppository. Vaginal um, suppository is how I used it most often in my practice. Uh, for vaginal dysbiosis. It can be used, a lot of people prefer the capsule if they're traveling. Um, it can be nicer to carry the capsule rather than the liquid. Having a little bit of technical problems here. There we go. Uh, so more recently, I guess five or six years ago at this point, was the development of the liposomal biocidin. So this is the biocidin liquid in a liposomal form. So if you're looking to treat outside of the gastrointestinal tract, then this is the product that you would use. The liquid biocidin stays more localized in the GI. The LSF would be for um, more direct access to the lymphatics bloodstream. Uh, also, we have research um, with Borrelia showing intracellular penetration. So if you're looking at treating an intracellular microorganism, say mycoplasma, the tick-borne illnesses, viruses, that sort of thing, then you want something that's in a liposomal form to, uh, to have better access to those pathogens. Um, also very useful topically. This is our SIBO clinical trial. So this was done at Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine by Dr. Danielle Lewis. And what she found, so the therapeutic was five drops three times a day of biocidin and the GI detox, two capsules a day. And there, this is after, 50, after eight weeks, 100% actually of the patients had in either improvement or resolution of their symptoms, 50% of them had the, the needle move significantly on the hydrogen breath test. Um, so very exciting research for us. And there were no dietary changes or other treatments used. After that initial study, the pilots, that initial pilot study, then the olivirex, this doctor brought in the olivirex, which then helped move the methane better on the, um, on the test results. So if you are looking at treating or looking at, um, excuse me, if you're looking at the methane producing microorganisms, please make sure and include um, olivirex in the protocol. Here's the, here is a list of her data collected. What I like about this is you can see on the far right column, the percent improvement. So 100% of people with diarrhea had improvement. 100% of people with nausea had improvement. 85% had undigested stool imp improvement in, um, or reduction of undigested stu stool um, or food, excuse me, in their stool. Reduction in joint pain, skin issues, ro and rosacea, 100% reduction. 100% um, improvement in those breathing issues, 100% improvement. So even though I, I know and I've seen clinically this product work, these numbers are so exciting uh, as a clinician to see. And I think when you start using this product in your, in your practice, you'll start to see this happen for you with your patients as well. Um, one of the mechanisms of action of biocidin is the disruption of the efflux pump. We were able to show this on, again, on our Borrelia research. Uh, what was amazing is that the efflux pump disruption decreased the um, dosing necessary of ceftriaxone to one eighth of its normal killing dose. And what, what it means is that, so the efflux pump typically takes something that's dangerous to the cell, whether it's an antibiotic or a, an antimicrobial, uses, that, or uses the efflux pump to push it back out. So if it detects something that's dangerous to it, it will push, push it back outside the cell. And that is one of the ways that it, it protects itself. And it, it's also one of the mechanisms for antibiotic resistance for microorganisms. We were able to illustrate um, and elucidate the mechanism here with, bio, with biocidin, both the liquid and the LSF um, in vitro were able to disrupt the efflux pump on Borrelia. 
This is our biofilm research. This is a study done in 2013 at the University of Binghamton. And you can see here, so the top graph is Pseudomonas, bottom graph is E. coli, and you can see a total dismantling of the biofilm. With Pseudomonas, it's almost immediate, but with um, E. coli over 24 hour period, um, in the presence of biocidin, we're unable to reestablish a biofilm. This is our uh, study on, this was published a year ago. It showed uh, against, uh, this is college athletes, and you can see uh, against placebo that a single dose of the biocidin throat spray, which is 60% alcohol, 40% biocidin liquid, that after a single use, the IgA in the oral mucosa increased by 66%. Um, so really exciting for us to be able to elucidate that. We've also had reports of people with elevated IgA have reduction in IgA using the, um, the biocidin liquid. Um, and we, we think, we're guessing, but we think that the mechanism of action there is, um, is that it, it reduces the pathogen load and the irritation to the immune system. And so the IgA can come down sort of naturally in that way. So this is the throat spray. This is the, the, the product that the study was done on. You can see here 40% biocidin, 60% alcohol, um, really nice for sore throat pain. This is our, um, our go-to as a company for staying well as we travel um, because of that mod modulation of the immune system. We also have a toothpaste now. This is 20% biocidin liquid. And then it also has a natural toothpaste base, some additional nutrients and, and um, herbs to help support dental health. It's kind of mint flavored. Uh, and I'm going to go forward and show you our other oral health product. This product, I think more of as superficial because it's the liquid. So if we're treating plaque, dental care, or if we're looking at plaque, dental caries, um, gingivitis, then you might consider using just the toothpaste. However, if you're looking to, to get deeper tissue penetration, you might consider the dental side in LS, which is a liposomal form of the biocidin. And so if you're trying to get that deeper tissue penetration that you might need with periodontal disease, uh, cavitations, root canals, then this product would be more well-directed. It does have, in addition to, this is bio, LSF biocidin with some additional nutrients to help stabilize the oral mucosa and treat, and keep a healthy mucosa in the mouth. So CoQ10, quercetin, clove, and myrrh as well. Um, so, and you can use the two products together if you'd like to. So oral biofilms, again, really important to address. These pictures, this is a biofilm on a toothbrush bristle, and that's the same toothbrush bristle, just at higher magnification. I like to think, and I hope, that my toothbrush looks different from this because I use the dental sidon. Um, but pretty motivating, right? We don't want to be smearing that around on our teeth every day. Uh, so the teeth, dental implants, prosthetics, they all provide a non-shedding surface that's where, where biofilms can establish themselves more readily because if, if, you, if they try to establish themselves on the mucosa, our, our mucosa is turning over consistently. But any area in the body where we have, that, that has a non-shedding surface is more likely to develop a biofilm. And that's what plaque in the mouth is, is a biofilm. Um, when we have those biofilms in the mouth, we can get translocation, we can get microbial shift. And what that means is damage to the tissue. So say, it, um, gingivitis pulls neutrophils to the area which fire at the the biofilms but have no effect on biofilm and that creates this feed forward inflammatory cycle which then draws more inflammatory mediators to the area damaging the the uh, tissue in the periodontal area and the proximity to this to the bloodstream in that periodontal area is so close that we can get tr translocation of metabolites pathogenic metabolites or inflammatory metabolites and the actual pathogen into the bloodstream. So there are a number of ways that it can be, it can, can uh, contribute to systemic illness to have uh, biofilms untreated in the mouth. This is a pilot study done by uh, Dr. Rothschild that shows DNA testing before and after using the biocide and LSF. What you're looking at is the scraping of a, a tissue and bone around a contaminated root canal. So before you can see a pretty long list there of microorganisms and after. Um, so the, these were, this was done on eight or nine patients, I can't remember which number, and it was an average of 35 pathogens before 
and three afterwards. What, what I love about this is it really illustrates that broad acting nature of the, of the um, biocidin. So you can see HPV on that list, cytomegalovirus on this list, uh, Prevotella, really important microorganism to pay attention to, um, and also Porphyromonas endodontalis. We also have on this list, not, not on this picture, but we know that um, in addition to that, Porphyromonas uh, gingivalis was also cleared in a different patient. So some really significant microorganisms that we, um, we want to see cleared uh, were cleared in this study. I will let this speak for itself. We'll be listening here to Barbara Tritz. So exciting for us to have someone who likes to do the re research in office study and also just to see the, the outcomes that she's seeing in her practice. Um, so another product in our product line is Proflora. It is three different strains of bacillus, um, subtilis, coagulans, and clausii. Uh, and we chose the spore forming microorganisms as part of our line as a line of antimicrobials because once you've suppressed the growth of the pathogens in the gut, it's important that you help support the restoration of the keystone or the healthy species and bacillus uh, has been shown to do that. So rather than trying to push lactobacillus or bifidobacterium back in on top of, of the gut after we've cleared the microorganisms or pathogens in the gut, what's important is to use this bacillus which helps reestablish things like acromantia and other um, obligate anaerobes that are there that help, that are there as keystone species to support and maintain long-term sustainable uh, balance in, in the microbiome. So that is why um, Rachel chose this particular form of, of probiotic. In addition to the bacillus, this also has quercetin. Um, so the quercetin that's in this product is actually 170 percent, so 1.7 times. That's a, that's a typo here, but more bioavailable than standard quercetin. It has better absorption in, in study when studied, um, and it, it is in the dose that we, has been shown to support um, healing of the tight junctions and the lining of the gut. Also, I, I really love this product for patients with histamine intolerance or mold exposure as well for mast cell stabilization. Um, so also has marshmallow root to help with healing, lining of the gut, and aloe vera to soothe mucosal tissue and to help with motility. Here's a study showing people that took big bacillus coagulans were, had a reduction in their, a significant decrease in clinical symptoms like bloating, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, and stool frequency when in, in IBS patients. Uh, olive, olivirex is our olive leaf formula. So olivirex, or uh, excuse me, olive leaf, a uh, very potent antiviral, um, excellent for, for then for any, any um, viral affliction. And um, you can see that, vi uh, excuse me, olive leaf itself, you're hearing me fumble a little bit because I, I, I'm trying to be very careful not to make any claims around this part product in particular right now. Um, none of this is FDA approved. Um, in terms of none of our products have been FDA approved for the treatment of specific of specific um, conditions. And so I'm, I'm being very careful about the language that I use right now. Um, so we're working on a verbal disclaimer. <laughs> and I guess that that's kind of it. Uh, but anyway, so the, the highest, this is the highest potency oleuropin content product on the market right now. Um, olive leaf itself has been shown to slow viral replication, budding, and attachment. 
Um, and the olivirix is a combination of olive leaf and some nutrients to help with, um, uh, excuse me, uh, drainage. And because Rachel has this training in, in acupuncture and oriental medicine, the, the olivirix, she has added herbs, Chinese herbs and other herbs to help promote the, the, and move the product, it's called the driver, into the system better. Um, also remember that if you're looking at the methane producing microorganisms, it, it appeared in the, in the pilot study that was done at Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine that it was more effective at supporting the reduction in hydrogen than um, just the biocidin alone was. GID tox is our binder. Um, so this is again a broad spectrum binder. It has activated charcoal, um, silica, um, zeolite clay. It has a, a, an addition of some um, apple pectin and humic and fulvic acid. So very carefully sourced for toxicity or low toxicity, I should say. And great binder. I typically dose this at bedtime. Um, it's it's really useful when you're working up on biocidin. Uh, again, it doesn't just clear pathogens, but also um, you're not you're not going to get just pathogen clearance, but you're also going to get um, biofilm breakdown. And those biofilms contain things like oxalates, heavy metals, um, LPS, and so people. It can affect compliance if you don't support them with the GI detox at the same time. And so we want to use bring the GI detox on board, uh, especially with that first bottle uh, to help mop up the uh, the metabolites from biofilms and uh, from toxigen or um, excuse me, uh, the die off of harmful microorganisms. This is an example of what a SIBO or CFO protocol might look like as reported by practitioners. And again, uh, not FDA approved. You can see it would be, include the biocide and the GI detox and the olivirex. Plus you may consider the probiotic, especially after you're done. Um, it's really important. You can do it through the whole therapeutic. Um, the, the proflora is actually lives through or is not killed by biocide. So it's okay to take it through the whole protocol, but really vital to take a bacillus strain of some sort for uh, helping, again, to help reestablish health beneficial uh, microorganism balance in the gut after a series of antimicrobial treatment or therapeutics. Um, the biotonic is a nice uh, adaptogen. It does not contain ashwagandha for anybody that might be sensitive to nightshades. It is uh, immune support in addition to chi support and also has artemisia, which is uh, Anti, um, anti-parasitic, but also prevents the growth of hyphae and yeast and mold. So if you suspect CFO, this could be a helpful addition as well. Uh, so these are a couple of case studies that I have. The first is, this is a 23-year-old patient, um, just over a year ago came into my practice, and uh, she'd been a lifelong bloating reflux, abdominal pain, you know, GI symptoms that had gotten a lot worse over the last few years, and then eventually had turned into persistent vomiting multiple times a day. When I saw her, she'd been throwing up every day for three months. She was on medical leave um, because she couldn't work any longer. She sat down on the couch and started crying. Um, she had seen her internal medicine doc that prescribed a PPI at 40 milligrams a day referred her to a GI doc who put her on another PPI at 40 milligrams a day. So she's on 80 milligrams a day of uh, PPIs and had no improvement. So what we did, she didn't have any money for testing. And so I, I gave her one bottle of biocide and that's all she could afford. Uh, she started with five drops twice a day. So I, I tend to ramp more quickly with my patients when they're so miserable already. I'm not as concerned about die off as I am just getting the symptoms. Uh, under control for the patient or watching the patient feel better more quickly. And so, <coughs> excuse me, uh, she was at five drops twice a day. I talked to her a week later and she'd had an immediate improvement in nausea and vomiting with episodes decreased by 50%. Um, at that point, we increased the dose to 15 drops twice a day. Um, and I actually didn't see her for months after that. And she walked, I walked into my office one afternoon and she was there in my store and I said, Hey, how are you? How have you been? And she said, Oh good. I finished that bottle of biocidin and I, and I've just been fine ever since. So not only did it resolve her nausea and vomiting, but all of her reflux pain and bloating also went away with a single bottle of biocidin. That's not 
what I would expect. Um, and it's also, I mean, it, it was, I felt like saying, you, you need to stay on it. Don't come off of it. <laughs> but she, for this particular case, it was all that she needed to help re herself reestablish uh, GI uh, homeostasis. And I, I did speak with her again later to get a for deeper intake. And eight months after the therapeutic, she continued to be symptom free. Um, this is Giardia case study with before and after testing. And you can see here, so positive for Giardia, this patient used uh, biocidin liquid and the biotonic, which has that artemisia in it. 15 drops a day of the biocidin, so five drops B TID, excuse me, and 10 drops BID of the biotonic, and you can see the after testing here. No other therapeutics were used. And then six months later, she had some diarrhea return and tested again, and it was due to something else. So GRD was still continued to be clear. Um, this is a molestum contagiosum patient. So you can see, um, gosh, do I, I not have, I don't have day one on here. So uh, unfortunately, I don't have the pictures from day one. Um, but I, what I can describe to you is all of these lesions that are crusted over were um, robust and uh, round and a, a secondary infection on quite a few of them. So um, this is nine days into starting LSF, the liposomal biocidin, orally and topically. You can see his lesions starting to crust over. Um, and this usually takes, molluscum takes six months to four years to treat. Uh, this, this baby had so many lesions too that it was basically not treatable by the uh, medical, to, uh, conventional medical means. This is day 16 and you can see the parents are saying, what a success. Parents are, oh, this is the practitioner said, what a success. Parents are ecstatic. I will let them know now they need to continue the LSF until all lesions are gone. Thanks for providing the product so this little guy could get better. So everyone's over the moon, unbelievable therapeutic and here's 31 days in. So really exciting as a clinician to see uh, to see things like that clear, um, and when it does, it's always um, it's always fun to keep um, keep the passion going for a product line like this. So uh, our company is extending the uh, the offer of fifteen or ten percent off um, all orders for the next week if you let them know that you attended the EHS conference, digital conference, and if you I just want to um, remind everybody that we do have a, a clinician on call. Um, Eastern time, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. daily, uh, so that if you need support in, in, um, or if you have questions about how to use the product, which products to use, um, or you want to learn more deeply, we offer, also offer free uh, clinical education by uh, practitioners in our office. So uh, please feel free to reach out to us and give us a call. And I, again, wish everybody well and uh, to maintain their health in, in these um, in the, these next few months as we see how um, everything is going to unfold with, with COVID. So very best wishes to everyone and uh, thank you for attending.